Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to those in Europe. This is Brad Horn, uh, one of the founders of PTS, and thanks for joining us today. I think we have an interesting webinar planned, and I'm kind of excited about it. So, why are we doing this webinar? And uh, the mobile OS marketplace and the enterprise making sense of it all. And when we say the marketplace, we're really talking about the operating system marketplace, uh, iOS, Windows Mobile, the remnants of Palm, which we probably won't talk about at all, and Android. We have discussions every day within our offices about what's going on in the OS world or the mobile OS world. And I listen to tons of different people and call people and try to get direction of where things are going. And we've what we've seen over the last couple of years is a, a fragmentation that's getting, um, or a split in the road that's getting uh, wider and wider. And we thought it would be a great discussion to open up to our users and our partners. And we'll open up the lines at the end of this call for your perspectives or your questions. But as it's noted on the bottom, uh, we don't really know the answer. So we have our opinions, and they vary within our organization of where things are going. But we, we strongly believe that no one knows the right answer, and anyone who does say they know where it's going is uh, um, slightly crazy. So anyway, some of the points we're going to key in on are, are the consumer OS needs versus the enterprise AIDC needs. Uh, we find that really fascinating how our enterprise devices are being driven by our 13-year-old children and the features they want. The operating systems that are being given to the hardware manufacturers are being driven by the teens and young adults who are using the operating systems for social networking. We've, we're going to talk about the different perspectives and motivations between the hardware manufacturers, the developers, the business leaders, and the ISVs. They all have a special interest in this race and all want things to go a certain way. And um, you know, if you ask them the future, they're going to all have their unique perspectives. So we'll talk about that and touch on that. And again, no one has a crystal ball. Um, if, we, if we look back, 15 years ago, no one could imagine that their Blackberries would be gone. They thought Palm was going to be around forever. Um, you know, and now 15 years later, the landscape has totally changed. And it's probably going to happen again in five years. These predictions that many of us are making are going to be wrong. In 10 years, we, we're not going to recognize what's going on. So uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kristen Como, who's going to moderate us today. Um, on the call, we have Howie Health Hex. Howie Hellman, <laughs> Howie Heckman, <laughs> that's his uh, gang name. Uh, Howie Heckman, uh, one of our lead developers. Uh, Dan Fluso, uh, my uh, partner in crime and co-founder at PTS, and myself, Brad, uh, at PTS, uh, one of the co-founders and more of the marketing and sales arm of the organization. So with that, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, maybe you can put out the first question for uh, Howie, Dan, and myself, and the community on the call. Great. Thanks, Brad. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to join the webinar. Um, as, an, as one of the account managers here at PTS, uh, my, often my daily activities include uh, many of these discussions with different users, um, end users, resellers, and even the manufacturers at times. And each of them hold a unique perspective. Um, what do you think is one of the biggest motivators when choosing an OS platform? Well, I mean, I think to get behind the scenes, the, the motivations are different between who's making the decision in every organization. That's where it kind of gets interesting. Um, I often, we've seen it over the years. You take an SMB who hires an internal developer who's uh, a younger uh, developer, and his motivations are going to be totally different. His choice may be totally different than that of a CIO who's concerned about stability and the, how long that OS is going to be supported. So let's you know, role play. 23-year-old developer, he's trying to get his resume in place. He wants something cool. To write down that he's developed Windows Mobile applications for his organization, it's not going to be something he can take out into the real world and uh, underline and highlight versus he says he does an iOS app. But is an iOS app really the right thing for that organization? And those are the questions an organization has to answer. Um, obviously, developers have a lot different perspective. Hardware manufacturers, again, if a hardware manufacturer is leading 
a deal, they're going to steer an OS towards what they're working on and what that salesman wants to sell. So as much as you try to be uh, transparent and honest, uh, a hardware manufacturer is not going to recommend an iOS operating system to a customer who may actually need it. I mean, Apple will, but the hardware manufacturer is not going to do that. It's very, very interesting, and I don't think we've ever seen it before. Back in the Palm and the Windows Mobile days, the manufacturers are kind of making both flavors. What do you think? Yeah, I think that those are all good points, and a lot of the OS decisions in the past were really based on, you know, what is the big OS that's being used for the particular task that I want. And in the enterprise space, originally that was Palm OS, and those were the only types of devices you could uh, get for that particular application. So you'd use uh, the Palm OS platform to develop, develop barcode inventory applications, things like that. That shifted over into another singular OS at the time, Windows Mobile slash CE. So in that transition, you were deploying your applications on that singular platform. And really what we're seeing now is there's a proliferation of different platforms that you can use. You could go the route of Android. You could go, still continue with some of the Windows Mobile or CE-based devices that have been released in the past and are still being released. Uh, on top of that, you have iOS-based devices, which are strictly controlled by Apple. So Hardware manufacturers in the enterprise space can't use that platform, but the customers that are deploying these applications now want to use that platform. So there's really a mix of different applications, and so the people that are making the decisions as to which OS to use and to utilize within their organization need to really take that into account as to, you know, a hardware manufacturer in the existing enterprise space may want to push Android because that's the route they have to go with some of their devices. They have to de deploy to um, an Android-based barcode scanning device because they can't use iOS. But then people within the organization that want to use iOS are going to want to push that platform. So you really have to take into account a lot of the different platforms that are available and what you can support and want to support in the future. And you want to make that transition so that maybe you, you have the flexibility of supporting all the different platforms within, within the organization. So I think that, that's kind of a, a, you know, a huge question right now as we as we transition from Windows Mobile and CE-based devices to these new platforms, uh, to take into account all of the different people that are motivating the movement into the different platform, what their motivation is, and then try to see what will benefit the organization most uh, to cover as many platforms as possible. And one of the interesting things I'll jump in to say, and we saw this back in the Palm days between the time when Palm and Windows Mobile, or I think it was even Pocket PC, were fighting it out. There's a lot of organizations that were deploying Blackberries throughout their 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 organization, and we we talked to leaders in those organizations who just deployed thousands of Blackberries, and they thought, you know, Blackberry was the future, and they were trying to strongly uh, suggest that we are missing the boat, and we should be looking at Blackberry to develop on. Now, obviously, we didn't. Um, I think it was a good decision. But you got to remember, if someone makes the choice to go down a certain path, they're going to really put that flag up pretty high when you talk to them. Because no one's going to say, after they just said, hey, my organization, we're going on iPad, that they made a mistake. They're not going to. That's putting their job at risk. So it's important to remember that. And uh, Another maybe good example of that is uh, some of the Microsoft decisions on their OS. Uh, the OS after Windows Mobile and CE went to Windows Phone um, 7, followed by Windows Phone 8 and Windows Embedded Handheld 8. None of those had upgrade paths to now even Windows Mobile 10.0, which is being released. So in jumping into that a singular platform like that, maybe there was a motivation at the time for that, uh, there was just no future path along that platform. So if something was developed that was strictly for that platform, you had no upgrade path in that case. So again, the consideration has to be made for what the motivation is for a particular platform. And is there a way to mitigate which platform you go, you develop your applications for that would allow you to kind of cross, cross platform or, or cover different platforms so that that doesn't happen. So you're not stuck in a box that you can't get out of with a particular OS. Yeah, and one of the things, yeah, one of the things we, uh, you know, all those points make a lot of sense, I think, probably to the audience. I think that's probably resonating with everybody. But one of the scenarios that's <clears throat> introduced now, too, with sort of this multiple operating systems fighting it out is the idea of BYOD, right, to bring your own device. So a lot of uh, stakeholders and decision makers aren't actually boxing themselves into one OS decision. 
they might have to support uh, multiple. You know, maybe some of their employees prefer Android and some prefer iOS, uh, and then maybe internally they're using some enterprise Windows mobile devices. Now all of a sudden you have a solution that really has to cover all three. Uh, you know, and that's that's definitely another consideration that we as a as a software provider have to consider. Well, that's a lot to think about, guys. Thanks. Um, what is PTS doing while all this fragmentation is taking place in the market? Um, you're buying a lot of crystal balls. <laughs> There's a lot of things we're doing. One thing is we're hedging our bets. I mean, we've done that all along. We yeah. hedge our bets. Yeah, I think a good uh, point to make from PTS's side is that we're looking to support as many platforms as possible and to make the best educated decisions to determine what platforms we should support. Like Brad mentioned, uh, BlackBerry, and uh, like I was making a point in the Windows uh, embedded space that some of those didn't have upgrade paths, uh, that we took what we were seeing in the marketplace and did not deploy to those, those particular platforms. So we're trying to cover with a, a the best education that we can, the most platforms as possible. So that's why you still, still see we're going to support Windows Mobile and CE-based devices, the existing devices that are out in the field, as well as the newer devices that are still being developed on those platforms. We also support all of the features that we have on Windows Mobile and CE-based devices on the Android platform. And we're currently in development, like Brad mentioned, with uh, iOS to develop Tracer Plus on the iOS platform because we are getting requests from our customers to uh, deploy on that platform as well. So we're looking to create a platform that will support all these OSs so that our customers can develop the applications they need with the assurance that they'll be able to deploy to any one of these platforms, you know, even within the same organization on different OSs. Uh, so that's something that PTS is investing in, just making sure that that pain point is not seen by our customers and they can kind of shift the application as it is to all these different OSs. Yeah, and, and one of the big choices there, too, is for an organization is what path they're going to go down on the software side. And we talked about the motivations a little bit. You know, the, the developers have a unique motivation and that I alluded to, uh, maybe not so much alluded to, but said they, they, a lot of people think about job security. And a custom developer's dream is to develop a good application with the latest technology, but also it may not line up with what the organization wants. The organization doesn't necessarily want a million lines of code. They want something that's easy to move from one operating system to the next operating system. And that's really what our goal is. We really have to think like the organizations that we're selling to to make it easy to shift. We understand that you know the horse that was leading the race at the first turn is not the horse that's going to be leading the race the next turn. And, and it happens all the time in technology. And we have to really get ready for that. I don't know if that happens with the custom developed apps as, what, as easily as maybe with a Tracer Plus developed app or something like a Tracer Plus RAD tool. What do you yeah, think I mean, I think, I, you... I think that's a, I think that's a, a good takeaway uh, from what our role is in the community. Uh, what we're taking on as our role is, is trying to take away some of the pain of those decisions from a software perspective. Of course, we can't control the hardware, but from a software perspective, you know, are you making a right decision to go with Tracer Plus? Sure, because we're trying to take that decision making of operating system out of out of your hands from, again from a software perspective um, and, and that's been you know one of our big challenges of course because we don't have a crystal ball like like Brad had mentioned uh, but it's it's nice I would think it's nice for the customer to know hey you know Tracer Plus has it controlled uh, and, and we can rely on them to to make the right decisions in those OS uh, decisions and, and we've seen it. People have gone to iOS, and it's the right decision for them, possibly. I mean, their users embrace the iPad. They want to use the iPad. They're maybe customer-facing, and a rugged terminal isn't the right thing for them. But they, they, they have to understand what they're releasing. And I think that's what, you know, we, we have to really educate our customers on what they're releasing. I mean, is iOS releasing a new update of their OS going to shut down a 1,000 users in one heartbeat? And we've seen well, yeah, that. I mean, if you, if you take if you take a, I think somebody mentioned the custom app. You know, that's a very popular way to to get your solution created, right? So it, it maybe something off the shelf doesn't exist, so you you hire somebody uh, outside, you know, third party to develop this app for you. It's custom coded in iOS. That has its own challenges even within the iOS 
framework in that, you know, every time you need to make a change, you have to go back to that source uh, to get the change made in its build, and, and it's got its own risks for, for issues and bugs. Uh, but the bigger problem is what if you, as a company, decide you need to move from iOS to Android? What do you do now? That, that person may not have the experience. They may be retired. They may be just off the grid. Uh, you're kind of stuck now in, in this environment of, sure, I have all this code written specifically for iOS, but I can't do anything with it. And, and that's a very real concern for a lot of a lot of uh, decision makers out there. Uh, you know, that's another thing to keep in mind, even from the mobile perspective, not even from the from the application perspective. And, and that's another one that, from the hardware manufacturers that we deal with, understand that the OS has to last a while. And we it goes back to your BYOD idea. I mean. If you custom develop something and you're releasing it on a Samsung Galaxy or an iPad, you better get prepared to future-proof this application. And if that's your choice, you're going to go down that road. We also have to think about what flavor of Android. Are you going to go with a consumer flavor of Android or a stable flavor of Android that is, you know, a Zebra or a Honeywell or a Cypher Lab or someone like that who said, hey, listen, we're going to support this thing to you know, 2025. Right. Well, speaking of iOS, I mean, I work with um, some quite a few developers who have utilized Tracer Plus within their organization as a tool to, you know, like we've talked about, um, scale amongst many different OSs, Windows Mobile, um, CE, some of them even use the old Palm version still. Um, and have moved to Android uh, for some of those Android devices that they've deployed in their organization. Getting a lot of questions lately about iOS and the roadmap and, and where PTS is with that. Could we talk about that a little bit? I don't know if the developers want to talk about it because it's a big project they have going on that they're being hit with deadlines for. But, uh... Or maybe some of the, <laughs> the, the hurdles that, you know, uh, or the challenges that, that you're facing with iOS. I, I think yeah, I mean, there's, there's not specific development challenges. Uh, it's a project we have underway now. Some of the challenges with iOS as an ecosystem, you know, are very real. You know, the controlling of the of the deployment of the apps is something you know that that a decision maker uh, deploying a project has to consider. You know, whether you're going to bring it to an uh, enterprise internal enterprise deployment only, or is it going to be available via the App Store? Uh, uh, Tracer Plus, the goal is to have it available via the App Store. Which is a little disconcerting for us because we have to we have to now rely on the schedule of of the app store approval and things like that. That changes our changes our development methodology a little bit, but that that's that's a you know a real part of of our process. Uh, and we are you know like I said, deep in the middle of that right now. I don't know if Howie wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean iOS it's currently in development, like uh, Dan mentioned. Um, we're looking to release that in sometime in 2016 here again. Some of the questions there for our exact release date are when, you know, what's the process going to be to get the App Store approval to deploy um, iOS. Some of there's questions on trial modes and things that we won't be able to do with that platform. But it currently is underway uh, and we are looking to release it so that all the features of, say, the Android and Windows mobile device are, are uh, supported on the iOS platform so that you'll be able to take an existing Android or Windows-based uh, application that uh, you've created and push it out to an iPhone, so you'll be able, to, or an iPad, I should say. So you sh should be able to run that same exact application on those devices. And I mean, it, along these lines, it's a um, another important point to make is that a lot of people, when they're using the iOS devices, it's maybe for a new application that they hadn't used in a traditional Tracer Plus deployment. They want to take Tracer Plus and deploy it for something entirely new within their organization, and it's not something that maybe some of the people in the organization would want to use some of the other enterprise class devices uh, for that for that project. Um, so really what's driving the iOS development is, is some of the new applications that we're seeing people use Tracer Plus for. So it's things um, that you haven't been done traditionally in the past and the, I, an iOS based device makes sense for that type of application. Um, and a lot of that could also be said for on the Android side, the Android tablets and things like that since they can be somewhat similar uh, in their deployments, but people want to be able to use those iOS devices um, for different applications within the, within the organization, not something necessarily that's required of an enterprise class device. So it, it is the correct platform for certain uh, situations. Uh, so that's why we're looking to support it, uh, and we're looking to support it in full and just the way we do with uh, Android and Windows Mobile and CE. 
Um, so again, that, I don't have an exact time frame on that um, from uh, PTS's side, but we are, uh, please know that we are in development of ILS um, and we're looking to release that this year. I, 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 just as a quick tangent, I, I'm sorry, this circles back to something uh, decision-making wise. Uh, you touched on a good point, Howie, that we didn't really mention was uh, ruggedization, of course, is a huge factor for a lot of a lot of people making this decision, right? So the hardware manufacturers that uh, make their own choices on OS have constraints on the decision they can make. Of course, they can license Windows Mobile from Microsoft, so that's a viable option. Uh, they can license Android, so that's a viable option. But consider that those those enterprise devices that people are making don't really have the option for iOS. So that's you know they just can't. Apple just doesn't offer the licensing. But one of the things that those devices offer that that really should be a bullet point in your decision is the level of ruggedization. You know, an iPad might be considered disposable and replaceable uh, simply because it's not as rugged. And, and that's, that's a big decision that people have to make too. I, I know that's not really related to the iOS question, but I do want to throw it out there. I, I think it is a good, good insight though, because it, it's the same thing with the OS ruggedization, I'll call it. Um, it's, if your organization is looking to do basic this is what gets interesting. Your organization may be looking to do something really basic. Now you're being force fit into Android or iOS, which you probably could have done with a Palm PDA years ago. Um, you're getting a lot of bells and whistles and a new OS for something that, you know, you, you really don't need it possibly. Obviously, it's going to be a lot easier to develop and use Tracer Plus with it, and that's our job, and that's what we've been doing pretty effectively. But you got to look at an iOS, I would think, and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, if you're looking for something to be around for five to ten years, then you don't want to fragment the devices in the field. I think that's a big X in the iOS space, and I, I, I may be throwing an opinion out here that I shouldn't, but would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good well, point. Uh, I, iOS is a lot of control from Apple as to what, you know, what's available, what you can do with the OS. Um, it's going to be updated. You know, every once in a while, and it has broken other applications that, we, as we've seen in the past, during those update um, processes. Uh, and it's it, in some ways at the OS level, it doesn't give you the flexibility that some of the um, other hardware manufacturers have with their devices, adding additional features and things like that. So I think it is good. Yeah, and, and I think Andro uh, fragmentation is is a real concern for any of these platforms. Uh, Android has the same. Criticism, I guess you could say, in that you know, Jelly Bean versus Kit Kat versus uh, you know, Marshmallow, the different flavors of Android that is, uh, do introduce changes, and that's a real concern for a lot of enterprises. Uh, you know, especially in the BYOD, I mentioned that market before. You know, one guy's bringing in his brand new shiny Galaxy S6 running uh, Kit Kat where somebody else has an older device, you know, how, how the challenge is how do you support those? And, you know, the goal of Android, of course, is to make that seamless and painless as possible, but there are definitely differences. And Tracer Plus, as a product, we see that, and we have to respond to those challenges. That's just, you know, another consideration is, you know, the fragmentation level. And, that, and fragmentation really exists on, on all platforms, Windows Mobile, Android, or iOS. And, and it almost should be welcome because it indicates that there is active development going on. So they are improving things and adding... Uh, adding new features and, and just improving the general experience. So fragmentation is kind of a, you know, necessary evil, I guess. Uh, but again, it's something to consider, you know, in that custom developed scenario, maybe you had your, your third party developer developing it for uh, KitKat. Now all of a sudden it doesn't work. What do you do? You know, are you stuck? Hopefully, hopefully you have access to that guy, you know, down the road. I think, yeah, and, and, and I'm going to ask this, uh, sorry, Kristen, just ask a question, but I'm going to ask a question here. I, I always hear people say that they know they can develop an app and they don't worry about fragmentation, this and that. And it's typically a web-based app. A lot of our customers can't get away with a web-based app. I'd almost say 90% of them can't. They have to use something like Tracer Plus or something that's a hybrid that can store locally and do all these neat things. It's really an enterprise app for critical data collection or management of, of uh, it could be anything from patients to children in a nursery school to assets that they have to look up and they can't risk losing all the work. Can you guys just explain a little bit the difference, I mean, between an HTML type of application that runs on a handheld and really doesn't mind about the fragmentation as versus a, a, a Tracer Plus-esque type of application that runs um, directly on the handheld and is built for speed and durability, let's say. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. Some, sometimes in, in opportunities we see, we, we are up against, uh, you know, let's say internal developers developing an internal web app. Uh, so that, you know, that's a real, a real consideration. But, but one of the things, I'm not sure I agree with that 90% number, but I, I think our customers are, you know, highly reliant on being able to work offline. You know, again, I don't know if it's 90%, but it's probably up there. Uh, so one of the big differences is that, is that web apps generally require 100% uptime. So you have to have a strong Wi-Fi environment or you have to be in a cellular environment that supports the web app. Uh, if you don't have that, it's almost a no-go. You know, I would say it's almost not possible to do it. But the other consideration is that web apps, in my experience at least, don't always have the best user experience. They're a little bit clunky in, in what you can do and what the interactions are. You're basically... Uh, constrained by what what you can do on your browser on your PC, right? There's certain things you just can't do. You can't access some of the hardware internals. Sometimes even accessing GPS data is a little bit challenging. Uh, getting access to the camera, you know, or the file system. All of those things are challenges. They're not insurmountable exactly, but the user experience is generally a little bit worse in a in a web only application. You know, and again, the biggest consideration we have uh, is getting back to that online always. You know, our our software generally uh, supports the live mode slash online access if it's available, but it does seamlessly drop into an offline mode when, when required. You know, whether they're working in the remote mountains collecting, you know, uh, environmental data, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to have Wi-Fi out there. That's where Tracer Plus is always, you know, always a stronger fit in, in, in our opinion anyway. And even with an Android, if you look at an Android choice, I, I, you know, the lack of being able to cradle sync, which may be important to a government agency. I mean, the ability to do an easy cradle sync is kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, going away. Yeah, well, some of those yeah. uh, existing installs that we have, people still want to do some of those basic things like syncing through a cradle, like they've done traditionally with Windows Mobile CE and all the way back to the Palm days. Um, some of those features, a lot, of, or a lot of the devices come out of the box Wi-Fi enabled when they don't want it. So they'll open up the device, power it up, and the first thing it asks you is for a Wi-Fi password, and they don't necessarily want that. They want to be able to stick with their old process of taking the device, popping in the cradle, and doing a sync, because they need, they're need they required to keep the device in a, a non-Wi-Fi environment. Um, so some of those Yeah, things, I mean, for gov I'm sorry, go ahead. Some of those things are just going to be a requirement, say, like an iOS device, where you're going to have to do some type of Wi-Fi sync or something like that, um, because you don't have... Uh, any way of doing a cradle sync through USB or something like that. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good thing, again, as a bullet point to consider. Is if your environment, you know, let's say you're, you're in the military or the government environment, and you have requirements that the hardware can't even have a Wi-Fi chip on it, uh, you know, some of these consumer devices in a BYOD environment, you know, that's not going to be possible. Try to, try to buy an iPad without a Wi-Fi chip in it. You know, whether enabled or not is one thing, but some of these requirements, especially for sensitive military can't even have the radio on the on the device. You, what do you do then? A lot of the a lot of the OEMs, the manufacturer OEMs who are developing Windows Mobile and Android devices have that as an option. You can actually get, you know, some devices whether without, without a Wi-Fi chip. You know, again, that's just another bullet point to consider. Great. Well, I'd like to remind everybody that we are going to be taking questions um, towards the end, which uh, leads me to pretty much my last. Questions. So if you can get your questions in uh, in the uh, question box, that would be great. Um, so it seems like no one really knows what direction the market's going in, and um, sounds uh, I don't know. I, w I think I'd like to create a, a time capsule here today, and uh, maybe schedule a another webinar five years from now just to you know uh, review what we've said today. But just, yeah, just to see how wrong we were. Yeah. On the fact that I am wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think it'd be great to get, uh, you know, kind of do some um, predictions. And uh, if I could get everyone's prediction of where they think the market will be in five years from now, that'd be interesting. Well, you're so definitely putting us on the spot there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what market are you, are you talking about? Our market or the whole consumer OS market, I guess would be my question. Um, I, I guess the, the OS market. Personally, I I think OS is being driven so much right now by the consumer, and I, I look at my 13-year-old son who um, doesn't use a laptop for 90% of things he does. He uses the mobile handheld, and 
he needs features that I didn't even know were going to exist 10 years ago. He uses things in the way I didn't even know they were going to be used. So for me to know what's going to be out there, for anyone to know what's going to be out there is impossible, including the current operating system makers. So I, I you know, three years down the road, I think you're going to see Android and iOS still battling it out. Um, I think iOS is, is a great uh, device. I think Android's going to have great devices and the hardware manufacturer is going to create a lot of great devices. But I, I see that there's going to be room. Someone's going to jump the idea what's possible and come out with something we haven't even thought about. And I think in five to ten years you're going to have a new player in the market just like Android was. What was it, five years? Was it, how long ago did Android come out really, Howie? 2007. Probably closer to ten years. Yeah, oh gosh, it's going quick. So in ten years you're going to see something new out there and, you know, all of this hedging your bets. So that's why I keep on telling my customers that I talk to, do you know, choose the operating system, not necessarily on who you think is going to win the race, but on the features you need today, and you know the the manufacturer who's going to be around in five years, and he'll he'll you know the software and the hardware should take care of you. So I again I I go back to that. I, I really don't know, but I would bet that it's something new. And I I also think that iOS as it gets older is going to I don't know this is I probably shouldn't say this, but I see my mother using iOS, and I just can't. I say this all the time. I don't know how kids think iOS is cool when they see my grandma on an, on an iPad. So I can't imagine when I was a kid and sneakers were the hot thing, using the same sneaker, which was a fashion state, as my grandmother was wearing. Right. Yeah, I mean, I just add to, I, I think I, I think I kind of agree with most of that. Uh, I think, in, in, you know, a five-year framework versus 10 years is probably very different, but I would think Android is still going to be pretty strong. I think iOS is obviously still going to be around. Uh, but I think what's going to hurt Apple in general is their closed licensing model. You know, I think that hurt them back in the PC wars in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and I, I feel like the same thing's going to happen. So they're either going to change their mind a little bit, because I think that was a very Steve Jobs driven thing. Uh, I think they're going to potentially change their mind and start licensing iOS um, to keep themselves competitive. Um, but I still feel like Android's going to be very strong. iOS is going to be in the, in the mix, I think, maybe not as strong. Uh, but I also think there will be some new players, something we haven't you know haven't thought about. Maybe there's uh, an OS that's centered around you know the new fitness craze, and it has a lot of uh, OS level type things implemented that address you know, you know the fitness market. Uh, we see that a lot with the wearables, right? So wearables could be changing things too. Um, I think it's just very hard to say, but I think the Android, iOS, and some new player would be a small percentage in the five, maybe closer to the ten-year framework. And of course, that's you know that's what what makes me pull my hair out is because we have to stay on top of that. We have to keep an eye on the on the market to make sure that our customers don't get burned by by some new uh, you know trending change. Yeah, I guess uh, from my side, I one thing I can say probably for sure is that it's not going to be a homogeneous. Uh, deployment of applications across an, or OSs across an organization <laughs> from now on. I mean, in the past, you may have seen Windows Mobile and CE just kind of the only deployment for an organization's uh, inventory or, you know, whatever they may be using the mobile devices for. And going forward, we're not going to see that because the people using these devices within the organization are going to have their preferences for a particular platform. I kind of disagree with Brad. I think iOS will stick around for a, a long time, and I don't think it'll ever be uh, licensed to different uh, manufacturers. But uh, I do think that that consistency in OS is going to be just, it's, it's not going to be there within an organization. So for the applications that are deployed in the future, they will need to be cross-platform, uh, offer cross-platform support that you can deploy that application and port it over to different uh, platforms rather seamlessly uh, because organizations are not going to want to make the investment every time a new OS comes out uh, to have to rewrite their apps. So for those deployments, you'd want to stick with a solution that gives you the ability to, to move to different um, platforms, uh, maintaining the, the support for all of those different uh, OSs that tend to maybe new ones that come up or things like that. Yeah, actually, I think that's a really good point. You know, I think the days of, of single mobile operating systems in the market are kind of over. I don't think we're just given the explosion of mobile. I don't think we're ever going to see, you know, Palm is the only choice or, you know, Next was Windows Mobile is really the only choice. 
uh, you know, now that we have Android iOS, there's, there's multiple choices. I think that kind of scenario is going to stay. There's always going to be multiple choices now just because the market is so huge. One uh, last thing I said, what's pretty interesting here is we didn't mention any of the Windows Mobile 10 uh, options that are going to be available. Win Windows Mobile 10 for Microsoft is uh, will be available, with, I think it's on two devices now. Um, but we're kind of sitting back to take a look at where that plays out in the marketplace right now. I think Windows Phone has something like a 1%, 2% adoption rate. So Microsoft has one heck of a way to climb there. Uh, to I think you're being generous. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, build their mobile devices, but that again is another option that people may take because maybe they have a preference for uh, Microsoft devices and maybe in certain devices that are released it would make sense and you know for certain uh, applications. I, you never know and that's where it gets interesting. Look, vinyl records are coming back and if you look at an operating system a lot of the things that we're using today could, you know, what's important today may not be important tomorrow and it may flip-flop back. It's, it's kind of, again, the operating system race itself is so fad-like and dependent on what the kids like. Meanwhile, we're thrown in this business world where we have to choose something that's going to be around for a while and be stable and do everything we need it to do. So just because, you know, I personally think, and I don't think iOS is going to be gone, Howie. I think iOS is going to be around. I just don't think it's going to be the, the hip OS for the kids anymore and may drop down a little bit. <laughs> Well, Get that into the time capsule. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, we're going to go to some questions now. Uh, uh, they could be questions about, you know, this topic or even just questions about PTS or Tracer Plus. Even we'll throw in some Clearstream there, too, if we have some time, if you have some questions. Or any input or your mm -hmm. thoughts on, on any of the talk that we've had yeah. over today. Yeah, that'd be great, too. Uh, we could open up that discussion. So with that being said, let's go to the first question. Uh, one question I know that's going to pop up here, if, uh, if it hasn't already, or you know, I think the question is a little bit light here, but that when is iOS available again? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we will be sending out updates on that as we get further along with development. Um, we are fairly far along there, but again, we always have that question of getting through the Apple uh, App Store approval process. Um, so as we get more detail on all of that. We will uh, be contacting everyone on the, the call today, as well as all our users to a better time. Great. Okay. Uh, first question. Um, we are about to deploy 25 plus rugged devices in our organization. Which OS should we choose? Uh, that's a great question. Um, it really depends on the features you need, I think, of that device. Uh, there are certain devices that are still going to be better for certain applications. Uh, some of the RFID devices uh, that are still available for window, uh, running on Windows Mobile and Windows CE platform. Now, if you need a uh, fast scanning, powerful RFID device, some of your only options there are Windows Mobile and CE. So I think if you wanted to go that route for that type of application, you should feel completely comfortable uh, going with a Windows Mobile or CE device. Um, a lot of the other applications, you know, it depends on exactly what you need. High resolution cameras, larger uh, real estate for the screen, maybe then you want to go with an Android type tablet device um, and feel completely comfortable using, going in that platform. So it really depends on the uh, application and the project you're working on, what features you need. Um, but I think the important point for us to make in this webinar is that you should feel comfortable with whichever platform you go with because those features will be supported on the different platforms. Uh, Windows Mobile and CE, they do have a finite lifespan as to when their support for Microsoft is available. Um, I believe it's or 2020, I think, is the end of support, complete support for those operating systems, at least Windows Com, uh, CE 7. Um, so you may want to look at making a transition in some cases to the newer OSs, uh, Android or um, in some cases iOS. Uh, so you will want to take a look at some of those, um, consider that, but just feel comfortable in the fact that if you're deploying on Tracer Plus, you will be, de you can be deploying to any one of those applications, even if you wanted to slowly introduce new OSs into your environment, you can do that. So you can run in a mixed environment. Uh, 
kind of application where you're running Android devices, Windows Mobile, maybe RFID devices or something like that. You can mix those as well as when iOS is supported, you could add those devices as well. So it's a very good question. Um, and sorry, I don't have the best concise <laughs> answer. But. No, I think that's, well, that's uh, you know just just to mention uh, we're very open to discussing those things because again you know I think I hope we highlighted the fact that every every environment really is going to have different requirements so if you wanted advice you know we're more than more than willing to to talk about that for your specific needs. Right, and I, I that's part of again one of my my daily activities is you know talking with resellers and and end users. Um, about a particular project. And a lot of times we don't even mention the OS. We just go right into the features of the application, which then um, you know, facilitates a conversation about the features of the device that they're going to choose. And a lot of times the OS uh, you know, doesn't even come up in the conversation. I'll piggyback on that. It really shouldn't if you're using Tracer Plus. And if it does, which it did in the early days because we, we were a younger software company at the time. Um, you know, we didn't support every OS in the beginning, and we still don't support iOS fully, but it really should be a, a fit, form, and function discussion versus in what OS is discussion, because a lot of the operating systems are uh, very close in capabilities, let's put it that way, versus in the olden days when, I mean, I just remember a Windows mobile phone was basically unusable or it was a pocket PC phone on the, on the way of doing email versus maybe a BlackBerry experience or an, an early iOS experience. So um, anyway, there's, there's a question here. We, uh, how do you see the penetration of iOS-based apps as against other apps in the industrial environment? I'm referring to Southeast to Asia market and people here use Apple products mainly for personal work. Um, we've seen a lot of iOS apps that we've lost deals to that, you know, someone at the upper end decision making has decided to choose iOS. Um, I've seen it go in a lot of spaces that I don't think it was necessarily the right fit. And it wasn't really from the operating standpoint, it was more from the, the device standpoint. So when you're choosing an operating system, and I think Howie touched on this, you got to make sure you have the, the ergonomic or the device that can handle the environment. For example, if you need a wearable, it's still wearable for an iPad that I know about, but you know I, I know a lot of the hardware manufacturers are going to have something out there shortly with a wearable for Android, RFID, you know, not 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 an integrated RFID gun, but there will be for Android and Windows Mobile. So it's really dependent on what you're trying to do. But we have seen iOS iPad devices go into inspection type of applications and those type of things where you, that big screen is nice to have. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I and the only thing, the only thing to add, I think, is the, the the key word in that question is industrial. You know, a lot of times I would I would kind of cringe. I've used iOS personally, and you know they are sensitive. You know, you drop that thing without at least some kind of protection, you're basically out 500 bucks, right? And that thing is going to break. <laughs> you drop it three or four feet. Uh, with the rugged devices, that's usually not a concern. Those those devices can really take a pretty good beating. Um, and I only say that because you mentioned industrial environment. Uh, and I think I think you're sort of agreeing when you say you know they're mainly using iOS for for personal work, so I'm expecting that that you're seeing other uh, OS penetration or other devices, not even the OS, um, you know, in, in, in moving into that into that type of environment. Yeah. And also battery life too, I think, is something to consider when introducing a device, you know, in an, a work environment. Uh, you know, eight hours a day of scanning. Um, you know, I don't an iPhone. You know, may not or iPad may not hold up. Yeah, and that's a very good point too. Battery life is always uh, something you should consider. You know, typically people need it for an eight-hour shift, right? Even if they're running three shifts a day, they still would expect a device to perform, you know, for a solid eight hours at least. And that's not always true with some consumer devices with high, you know, high high usage. Okay, okay another question. Uh, if we are developing an application for, say, Android, how long would we reasonably expect that application to be viable before it becomes unusable? Um, I'll go to the standpoint of the devices. Um, I think it's going to be a lot like, excuse my voice, I got a frog. <clears throat> I think it's going to be a lot like the Windows Mobile devices 
in that they're around, the manufacturers are there to support it. So if you create the application, as long as you deploy on a device that is guaranteeing some OS stability, I mean, that'll be around. Will you be able to get new devices? You have to listen to the manufacturer and what they say they're going to do. Um, how long will that operate? I mean, Howie, from the development, or say you personally develop something and you're using consumer devices, how compatible is that as it upscales through the operating system? How many problems are they going to have? Yeah, I would say that oftentimes it will be upgradable to the new version of the OS, but you, you can't have that expectation that when the OS is upgraded, all of the features that you had developed for that application are going to work in the same way. So there could always be, with every upgrade, something in the application if, if it's not changed, something that could break. Um, unless you were to go with like what Brad said, maybe some manufacturer that develops a device that has a version of its OS that will be guaranteed for say five years, where they say you can always purchase this device with this OS. And then for that length of time, you can kind of guarantee that your application will work for those uh, five years that they offer that device with that operating system. But for a consumer-based device, you may not have that option. You, you, BYOD device. The employee may come to work, upgrade their device because the, the uh, upgrade was just pushed out from the manufacturer, uh, and in that upgrade, it breaks the application. I mean, you see that in the news all the time when uh, a new OS update for window, uh, I'm sorry, iPhone comes out, new iOS device, you'll hear of different software houses that are rewriting their application to support the new platform. And that could be said with any platform that you go with, Windows Mobile, Windows uh, Windows Mobile 10 now, uh, or an Android-based device. Um, so you just can never guarantee that the application will work every time that an OS upgrade uh, comes out. If you're talking about a Tracer Plus application, that's where PTS is taking the investment to make sure that the application that you've developed will be compatible with the newest uh, versions of that OS. Now, that's not to say Tracer Plus is always just going to work on every OS upgrade. It's that we will be making sure that the things that change in that OS, Tracer Plus will support, and therefore your application that you generated within Tracer Plus Desktop will run on that new OS update. Yeah, and if we were to put a time frame, I think anything you develop should last at least five years with the hardware being made by the rugged manufacturers, and you know, Tracer Plus will at least support five to seven years. Uh, with that build, uh, we have customers who are on our 4.0 version still using it. Now we're, you know, about to release 10 with iOS. Um, I think that says a lot about the AIDC industry, and it really does understand what an enterprise needs. Unfortunately, it's probably not the best thing for business because someone can stay on the same device and and even go some routes we don't like, like eBay, to get devices that are very old and keep their operations going. Um, but it, it definitely fits the customer's needs. Uh, next question, which I'll, there's a bunch of the questions that are kind of in line as I'm reading through, and it's an area we didn't really hit on. But the idea of the Internet of Things and uh, um, wearables and RFID and all the other exciting things coming around the bend, how do we see PTS working with that? And I'll, I'll put it on a high level, and I'll let these guys dive into it. The world is changing, and there's so much innovation coming out with technology, and we see a lot of the big hardware manufacturers going after the Internet of Things. I don't personally think we really know how far it's going to go and how quick it's going to go. But what we look at is the technology, and our goal has always been to take vetted technology, hence why we waited on iOS just a little bit, um, to take vetted technology and integrate it with our platform. We look at the development efforts to do certain things, and we may get things in sooner than maybe they're ready for it in the technology side, but we also look at the return on investment for our customers. So we're actively looking at some um, wearables that may be consumer-based. Uh, Near-field communication was mentioned. We don't know where NFC is going versus a, uh, a true um, RFID type of app. Uh, sleds are becoming really popular for RFID. We're looking at all of these things and we're developing a forum. Um, we're very, very aware of what's going on in that organization. And the other thing to mention is Clearstream RFID, um, which maybe wasn't the best name putting RFID on the end of it, but that's kind of the vision we have for Clearstream is that sensor-based 
uh, reading of data from remote points and managing it, and getting it into some sort of database so it's easily uh, used. Maybe Howie and Dan can piggyback on that a higher level. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say that the, the IoT, Internet of Things, uh, is very interesting. You know, I, I think there's a lot of growth there. Of course, you know, Microsoft was playing around with that idea, you know, 15, 20 years ago, but but I think it was probably ahead of its time. Uh, that's something you know we're keeping an eye on. There's, there's not a clear you know vision of what what we want to do there yet, but but it really is very interesting. And I think uh, Clearstream RFID, if any of you guys are familiar with it, is probably a natural place to implement some IoT support. Um, when you talk about NFC and wearable devices, those are things we're a actively looking at, uh, and I would expect some some support in Tracer Plus for that, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. I would say for both NFC and wearable. Uh, and I, th I think it's a great question, you know, for future and, and future type considerations. The wearable, some of the decisions we make too are tr trend driven, and uh, what someone may want to buy. So if you look at the wearables, that's probably top on our list. I think a lot of consumers aren't necessarily, or enterprises aren't necessarily happy with the wearable choices they have from the rugged manufacturers, and the new watches coming out may fit in nights for heads up displays. I'm very interested in what you guys think on that, so if you could uh, let us know um, where it sits in your mind, the idea of integrated watch support and NFC, we'd love to hear from you um, to get a little bit of the trend in your thoughts. Uh, go ahead, Chris, the next one. Um, do we get notifications on upcoming releases of mobile device OS versions? Yes, we do. We get a lot of updates, too, as well of OSs or devices no longer being manufactured. And we see a trend kind of going on with the leading manufacturers killing off the Windows mobile devices and pushing towards Android, which makes a lot of sense as they're, they're looking at sales and you know big deployments and what people are going to go with. And then we see a lot of the little manufacturers saying they're going to support the mobile apps. All are saying they're going to support Windows mobile to, I think, what is it, Dan, 2020, they have the ability to integrate Windows mobile into the devices they manufacture and is going to support it beyond that. Am I wrong? Yeah, I, I think one of the other nice things about being in our position is that we are part of uh, the beta program for a lot of our OEM partners. So we get early access to some of these devices, which allows us to sort of, you know, get a peek into the future, but also allows us to get, uh, you know, formally certified on these devices before they're even released. Uh, and that's just the nature of, of us being in the market with, with our strong partnerships with the hardware OEMs. Uh, you know, that's that's not really the consumer OS type uh, insight, but we do see it with the with the hardware manufacturers that we partner with. And that's been really beneficial to really both sides, I would think. It's also interesting, too, to me at least, that there's so much in the way of available secrecy around what's going on with a lot of the operating systems from the operating system companies and the releases. and especially with the Windows side, the confusion with Windows 10 and um, Windows Mobile 10 and the releases and what's coming out in the way of hardware there. Um, uh, for example, we don't, don't see any RFID devices coming out in the near future with integrated Windows Mobile 10, but we also don't see it on the Android side. So, you know, with the lower volume type of things, it seems like there's like some major indecision on which way to go. Any thoughts on that? Or? I mean, there's certain there's certain instances now where the like an integrated RFID device, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, Windows Mobile and CE are some of the only platforms that you can get that type of device, um, and it's not as we've seen in many roadmaps of uh, say an integrated Android device with uh, with RFID built into the device itself. Um, but coming back to that, if we do see those devices. Uh, from our manufacturers, those are things that we will look to support relatively quick, quickly within Tracer Plus um, to make sure that all of those features that are available on the platform are also available within Tracer Plus. And it's important to note too on the RFID side, since it's become like shuts a big part of our business, and I think we're really, really good at it. It's not one of the best for the the price, and maybe in the best for just features. Um, we see a lot of RFID sleds coming out, um, and it's, they're becoming popular. And, and they'll say they integrate into iOS or integrate into Android or integrate into Windows Mobile from smaller tier manufacturers. And even some of the big ones are coming out with sleds. If it's not using the same APIs for what you're doing, 
that doesn't mean much unless they have a wedge available. And even the wedge is not a full featured RFID implementation. So when Howie says an integrated RFID device, it's important to note that with Tracer Plus and any other application, that is not going to be available to you unless you go with the API on that integrated device or that in API on the wedge. On, sorry, on the sled or the uh, the Bluetooth enabled RFID device. I don't know if someone wants to clarify what it actually. Yeah, just, so I'll, I'll just I'll just clarify what you mean by wedge. Uh, so so when we use the term wedge, it means typically it means a keyboard wedge. So when you're when you're talking to an external device like a barcode reader or an RFID reader. Uh, the wedge basically just scans a barcode, for example, and dumps it into the device as keyboard data. So wherever your cursor is blinking, that's where your barcode data is going to go. Uh, that works pretty cleanly for barcode. You can get away a lot of times with just a barcode wedge. Uh, in RFID, because you have that, that very fast multiple read type scenario, using a wedge doesn't always make a lot of sense. As a matter of fact, often it doesn't make a lot of sense. So a lot of the manufacturers don't even provide a wedge. So now all of a sudden you have this nifty, neat sled, and it can read RFID tags, but the concern then or the issue becomes what do you do with that data? You, you really do need to natively talk to the API uh, and that's what we spend a lot of time doing. You, you know, with any of the manufacturers out there, we spend a lot of time incorporating that API into Tracer Plus itself. And another thing you also sometimes lose with the Bluetooth wedge for those RFID devices are things like the Geiger counter feature where you can search for tags or writing to tag. Those aren't offered in, in the wedge applications to be able to perform some of those features. So you, again, you'd have to go back through the API to do that. You'd want to, be, uh, to talk directly right. with the computer so that you get things like proximity to the tag as well as uh, being able to write information to the tag. Yeah, and if you're talking about NFC, you know, near field communication, uh, near field or NFC is really closer in functionality to barcodes. So, so a wedge in that sense might make more, you know, might make sense because you're not, you're not expecting to make multiple reads within the same second, for example. Uh, you know, NFC being almost touch, touch based type thing. Uh, but again, RFID and wedge don't typically play well together. I think we're getting to the end of the time here. So um, if anyone else has questions, pop them in. I guess we'll start wrapping up. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming out. We had a really good turnout for this. As I think you can see, we um, have some opinions on the future. Uh, we have some good information, but we don't necessarily know what the future holds, nor does anyone else. Um, at least we, we don't think they do. Uh, if anyone wants to discuss this with us, please give us a call. Um, we're, we're open to communication on the topic and very interested in your viewpoints. Uh, on the screen here, you'll see that we have our YouTube page listed for Tracer Plus. There's one as well for Clearstream. Um, we have our Facebook if anyone wants to get social. <laughs> We have Twitter if you'd like to tweet. Um, uh, more importantly, we have LinkedIn, a LinkedIn community, which I think is really popular. And uh, you follow us, our company on LinkedIn, and we have a couple user groups set up for uh, Tracer Plus and Clearstream RFID, where we're doing on announcements. Something that's not listed here, which I'm surprised we didn't put it on, is we do also have a news group. Um, and I think it's forums. Where is it, forum? You can get there from our website right up on top of the uh, home page is a, uh, a link to the forum. Yeah, and the you have that slide, question, we hope you have that slide showing with the contact info there, Brad? Sorry. Yes. Okay, I'm not seeing it. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, EBCAC. Uh, anyway, uh, so those are all the uh, sites for us. And as Kristen said, you can get to the forums from our um, website. I hope it was uh, valuable for us. Anyone else want to add some closing thoughts? And we'll wrap this up. I think I'd just like to say first, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you hopping on the webinar. Uh, and again, we're looking for your, your feedback. So after the webinar today, if you want to reach out to the contact information on the, that you see on the screen here, please send over anything you'd like or give us a call. Uh, definitely I'd like to hear your opinion as well or if you had any other questions for us uh, as far as Tracer Plus and our OS support and, and roadmap. So again, thanks uh, for joining us everybody else. Yeah, I think that was, I think that was, you know, hopefully useful. Uh, if you didn't notice, it was a very unscripted type, um, you know, conversation. 
So I, you know, I'd, I'd personally love some feedback on that too. Did you find it, uh, you know, distracting, or did you find it, you, you know, more real, I guess, or more honest? Uh, you know, any feedback like that is always welcome too. Yeah, I'd really love to hear the feedback on this type of forum. Um, it's pretty easy to put together, and I think I hope there was some information for you. Anyway, uh, with that said, thanks so much, and we're going to uh, sign off.